Good afternoon everyone. Before we begin, may I request everyone kindly to keep your mobile phones in silent mode or you can switch it off. Welcome to the inaugural lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series in Social Theory at Tata Institute of Social Sciences initiated by the Center for Social Theory School of Development Studies, GISS. This series has been launched to stimulate the process of social theorizing in the Institute and in Mumbai and the rest of the country, focusing on an engagement with cutting-edge social theory at the international level and developing the theoretical capacities of the huge empirical work done by TISS. May I now call upon the dais, Mr. Alauzia, Director, Alliance Procès, Mumbai. <laughs> Mr. Loho Bodhi, Alliance Procès. Professor Anne Chen, Chair, Intellectual History of China, College de France. <laughs> Professor Partha Sarathi Mondal, Chairperson, Center for Social Theory, School of Development Studies. <laughs> Professor Chen has kindly consented to deliver two lectures on the Confucian concept of humane governance. May I now call upon Ms. Kanchan to present the bouquet of flowers to the members on the dais. May I now request Professor Paratha Sarthi Mondal to present the institute show to Professor Cheng. Now may I request Professor Mondal to chair the session. Uh, uh, thank you, Shilanan. Uh, <coughs> a very hearty welcome to all of you. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to uh, say that uh, we have our director of uh, process, Parsunaman, in our midst. And uh, he sort of uh, gave me the honor of uh, chairing this session. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it is a very significant event uh, that uh, we are holding today uh, because uh, we have the opportunity of uh, sort of uh, presenting to you one of the foremost exponents of uh, uh, Chinese intellectual history uh, to the audience here in Mumbai and to uh, our students and colleagues at TISS. Uh, Professor Cheng is an internationally renowned expert. And she comes from a very famous institution, the College de France. And we are very proud and happy to uh, have this uh, event with us today. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to record my uh, thanks to our director, uh, uh, Process Parsuraman, for making this uh, thing happen. So thank you very much. Uh, we are also very grateful to uh, Professor Cheng to have uh, taken some time off despite a very hectic schedule. 
Uh, she is, uh, uh, you know, internationally booked for the whole year. And uh, I sort of expressed to her that we are busy with our examinations at this time, but she had no other time. And uh, we did not want to miss this opportunity. So uh, she is here in front of us today. Uh, uh, she will be uh, speaking uh, broadly for two days on the uh, Confucian, uh, you know, uh, philosophy of uh, governance. And uh, uh, she has broken her uh, lecture into two parts. You have the titles uh, in front of you. Uh, today she is going to speak on humanness at the core of the original Confucian teaching. And uh, uh, tomorrow she will be speaking to us again at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, so please do come. Uh, we hope that uh, her visit here will initiate uh, a discussion, a contemplation, a reflection of, uh, uh, you know, of China, of uh, Chinese uh, roots, uh, the close connection that we have civilizationally and philosophically with China. And uh, we want to make an attempt to overcome the geopolitical and the security framework within which, uh, you know, India and China usually uh, interact. And uh, I'm very happy that we are able to uh, uh, present this talk in front of two very senior officials from the educational wing of France, uh, you know, the Alliance France is here. Thank you very much sir, for coming. And uh, we have the uh, Consulate General of France. He was uh, supposed to come and, uh, you know, attend this talk, but uh, some emergency business has called him back to the Consulate. So he has wished us very well for this. So we thank him for uh, you know taking the trouble to come and uh, at least see us here. Uh, without wasting further time, may I now request uh, Professor Cheng to present her lecture. Thank you. So uh, can you hear me, everyone uh, at the back? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'll um, uh, be talking standing because I'm very short, you see, so if I uh, stand behind the pulpit, I mean, you won't see me anymore, you know, so um, I'll, um, I want, uh, first of all, to address my uh, deep hearted thanks to uh, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, yes, what's the gesture? You can't hear, is it? Or well, you can hear, it's okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, my uh, uh, deep hearted thanks go to uh, the uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences and to its director, Professor uh, Barasu Raman, uh, for welcoming me here. Uh, actually, for the second time, I was uh, here on a brief informal visit uh, last March and began talking to uh, Professor Mondel, who, uh, who is uh, at the origin of this uh, very kind invitation. Uh, and we um, started talking um, about our uh, mutual concerns, and I could sense that uh, Professor Mondel was open to, um, um, you know, something about, um, let's say, um, the um, uh, wish for dialogue between between uh, India and China, uh, because uh, as Professor Mondal has just said, um, uh, India and China are usually envisaged, you see, as the two so-called giants of um, Asia, and uh, always, you know, in uh, rather you know sort of complicated and difficult uh, geopolitical um, uh, relationships, you see, because of um, you know the recent history. But we are, you know, academics, we are intellectuals, and I don't see why, you know, we should uh, uh, take the same stance as our political uh, deciders. And um, uh, so I, uh, standing from a French uh, standpoint, you know, uh, since I, I was born and bred in, in France, and uh, I'm a French citizen, a daughter of the French Republic, um, I think that there's this um, interesting, let's say, uh, mediation uh, that is offered by France see, for, for this uh, uh, conversation you know, between, uh, between India and China. And as a representative of the uh, Collège de France, which I'm going to uh, present briefly in this uh, uh, PowerPoint, um, um, I, I am preparing a conference that, would, that will involve uh, scholars from India, and also scholars from China and from France, you see, talking about, um, uh, let's say, a comparative view 
uh, the questions of uh, continuities and discontinuities uh, in India and China. And in a way, the two lectures I'm going to, uh, to give now uh, are a sort of um, uh, preparatory ground, you see, for, for, this, uh, for this conference, because uh, uh, the, the main, let's say, the central uh, issue will be, you know, uh, the question of, you know, continuity and discontinuity, uh, especially between what, what is usually called, you know, tradition and uh, what is usually called modernity, all these terms being, of course, highly uh, problematic. So before I start, um, I'd um, like to, as I usually do when I'm uh, in um, uh, traveling in uh, an institution abroad, um, um, proceed to a brief presentation of what the Collège de France is as an institution, because uh, you may have heard of some uh, rather big names in the social sciences, uh, everyone, you know, in, uh, let's say, uh, American and uh, European academia, and, and also Asian academia, by the way, uh, will know about uh, Michel Foucault and uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, but many people won't know that were, they were actually professors at the uh, Collège de France. Um, so uh, this institution is um, uh, very typical of the spirit of the European Renaissance uh, humanism, since it was founded in 1530, you know, in the 16th century, by um, uh, the King of France, Francis I, and um, uh, under the impulse of uh, one of the major scholars of uh, European humanism, uh, that is Guillaume Budé, uh, whose statue stands, you see, in the courtyard of the Collège de France, and the motto in Latin of this institution is uh, docet uh, omnia, uh, meaning that this institution teaches everything. Um, um, implicitly meaning that the Collège de France was founded to teach everything that the Sorbonne, you know, which stands right, you see, beside it, uh, didn't teach at that time. The Sorbonne, uh, in the 16th century, was still very much under the influence of the church, you see, and uh, you have uh, the Sorbonne, you know, a sort of very normative uh, teaching that excluded uh, some disciplines that weren't considered um, uh, useful in the, let's say, uh, Christian um, uh, orthodoxy or Christian theology. Uh, and therefore, the Collège de France was the first institution in Europe uh, to create such chairs as a, a chair for Arabic, a chair for Hebrew that were, you know, created right in the 16th century, and a bit later on, uh, in the uh, early 19th century, the first chair uh, in Sanskrit studies, uh, and at the same time in, in Chinese studies. And uh, this year, uh, 2014, we've been celebrating uh, the um, uh, 200th anniversary of these uh, two uh, chairs. So. Um, the uh, Collège de France is a, is a rather specific institution because uh, it's not a university, uh, that is, it's not organized in uh, departments uh, with regular students coming in to take um, uh, degrees, so the Collège de France doesn't deliver degrees, but uh, the teaching, uh, which is supposed to be at top level, uh, is open to everyone, meaning that anyone, you know, can, can walk in um, and uh, take any uh, lectures or course he, uh, he or she likes. Uh, it's free. You don't have to produce any, um, you know, let's say, um, uh, degree evidence of, uh, of your educational uh, level. Uh, and um, it's and now, of course, I mean, with, with the new uh, technology, uh, nearly all the lectures uh, of the Collège de France are available online, uh, so you can access them uh, absolutely uh, freely and um, uh, download them, you know, freely. And uh, they are usually, of course, in French, but also available in English. And in my case, in the case of my lectures, they are also available in Chinese, if the information interests anyone. So um, there are about 
50 chairs, you know, um, uh, which are distributed more or less half and half between, let's say, the uh, what's called the hard sciences on the one hand and the humanities uh, on the other. And uh, so here you have a um, um, uh, photograph of our assembly room. So the uh, Collège de France is run in a perfectly collegial way, meaning that we are not dependent on any uh, political, political kind of authority or power, uh, because uh, we make all the decisions uh, um, uh, by uh, assembling three times a year in this, uh, in this room and voting for every single uh, decision. Okay, so uh, it's, um, and it has been running like this ever since its foundation in the 16th century. So uh, this independence is absolutely vital for us uh, to um, preserve uh, this, um, let's say, intellectual uh, freedom in our investigations. Uh, so on top of the uh, 50 or so cha permanent chairs, you've got a number of uh, temporary chairs, uh, usually for just for one year, uh, covering some, uh, let's say, subjects that are, you know, um, have a sort of more, uh, let's say, rapid turnover, uh, like in the uh, artistic creation, technological I innovation, uh, we also have, and that might be of special interest to you, a special chair for sustainable development uh, and uh, for uh, knowledge against uh, poverty. Um, so, um, the first uh, mission of the uh, Collège de France uh, has been summarized by the French philosopher uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, who was um, talking about the idea of uh, teaching uh, not, you know, a sort of uh, set of, uh, let's say, established knowledge, but, um, you know, uh, teaching research uh, in the making. And here you have um, a picture of um, the uh, largest amphitheater of the uh, Collège de France. That's where I usually teach uh, every week, and it's, uh, it can sit about uh, 450 uh, people and it's usually it's usually full, you know. So that means uh, we have this capacity for uh, talking to our uh, fellow cit citizens. And when I uh, say fellow citizens, I not only mean you know the uh, French fellow citizens, but also fellow citizens of the world. Since, uh, as I've just said, our lectures are available online and you can access them from wherever in the world, including China for the time being, at least. Um, uh, and um, uh, here you have a sample of um, uh, the uh, publications of our inaugural lectures. And uh, I didn't choose this uh, slide. You see you have uh, my own um, uh, inaugural lecture, which is entitled, Does China Think? And this is a real question. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I, I didn't uh, choose this uh, photograph either. You can see me in my inaugural lecture here. Um, and um, the Collège de France has also this uh, uh, vocation of um, a very broad opening on the, on the world. The Collège de France is, uh, um, let's say, uh, always organizing international conferences and uh, invites um, uh, scholars and lecturers from abroad and uh, as I've uh, said earlier, you know, I'll be inviting a number of uh, uh, Indian scholars uh, to Paris uh, uh, this uh, coming June. So, um, and I'm uh, uh, actually uh, pushing towards um, uh, the signature of some MOUs between the Collège de France and some Indian universities. I've uh, done this already uh, with the, um, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I just shut, shut it down. Um, uh, I've done this uh, with the um, uh, University of Tokyo. I've just done this with a university in Shanghai in China, and I'm intending to uh, do the same, um, you know, on the um, Indian side. So you have an idea here of the of this uh, uh, opening of the Collège de France on the world. And the, the second mission of the Collège de France, of course, is uh, research and research training, since we're supposed to uh, teach 
uh, research in the making. And you have here um, uh, an idea of the um, laboratories of the uh, Collège de France, since uh, uh, we have a number of chairs uh, in physics, um, chemistry, uh, mathematics, and you may know that uh, one of our recent uh, Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, 2012, uh, was attributed um, uh, partly to a French physicist, uh, Serge Arroche, who is uh, a professor at Collège de France and who is now our uh, administrator. Uh, and uh, here below you have a sample of uh, some uh, manuscripts in, in Chinese, which you can find in uh, one of our uh, libraries. Uh, so this is uh, this is the building of uh, the um, uh, laboratories, and uh, the Collège de France is not only um, let's say an institution for professors, but uh, you also have uh, attached to each chair some young research fellows, uh, assistants, and um, uh, technicians, postdoctoral students. Uh, so that uh, means quite a lot of uh, people all together. We also have a number of libraries. I've uh, shown you some samples of the um, um, Chinese manuscripts that are kept in the um, Oriental uh, Studies Institute. And uh, here is an important element of the Collège de France, it's our cafeteria. Uh, it's not interesting for the food, which is rather common, but for the, for the view, um, uh, you, can, you can see all of Paris, you see. So uh, if you come and visit, you're all welcome. Uh, do uh, visit the cafeteria, you know, just for that reason. Okay. Uh, so the third mission would be the uh, dissemination of knowledge and uh, research. So the Collège de France has a number of uh, uh, publications, both in uh, print, uh, you know, paper, and uh, in uh, online uh, publications, on top of all the, uh, let's say, podcasts of uh, our lectures. Um, and uh, here are just um, you know the, the uh, various newsletter and the uh, summaries of our um, uh, teaching, and of course this is um, uh, what you will get on the uh, let's say uh, front page of the Collège de France uh, website. And we end up with a photograph of the um, uh, central courtyard of um, of the Collège de France. Okay, so. Uh, it's very easy to find. It's sitting right beside the so beside the Sorbonne, you know. Uh, and uh, actually, these two institutions were actually in competition, and uh, that's what makes all the interest of it. Okay, so now we could uh, proceed to the to the next part here. So um, as uh, I've been uh, saying, um, my point. Uh, so, how much time do, do we still have? It's, uh, it's uh, 20 to 4. Uh, an hour, okay, yeah. Uh, I try to, uh, to be as uh, brief as possible so as to, uh, because I know that I'm addressing um, an audience that uh, um, I, I don't, uh, I've never met, you see, so I don't uh, know what, where, where your interests are. I suppose, I mean, you are all representatives of some kind of discipline in the uh, uh, social sciences. Uh, but um, on the other hand, uh, I don't really know uh, where your, your uh, focus of interest would be. Um, I have to uh, apologize, first of all, for not being myself in any way an expert, you know, in uh, social sciences. You see, I was trained as a classicist. Uh, since I've been um, uh, trained at the École Normale Supérieure, you know, which dispenses some kind of very classical uh, humanistic uh, teaching. Uh, so I was trained in uh, you know, European classics, uh, Greek, Latin. Uh, and then, of course, um, well, of course, no, it, it wasn't a matter of course, but I decided to uh, take an interest in my, let's say, ancestral culture, since uh, although I was born and bred in, in France, you see, uh, I'm of Chinese uh, ancestry, I think it shows. Uh, and um, uh, uh, in the course of my uh, studies, I decided to uh, dedicate uh, a lot of attention to, uh, let's say, the uh, culture of my ancestors. 
Um, but of course, the, the, all this training is, is very, uh, let's say, classical and philological in nature. So you might find my approach uh, rather rather funny to, to um, in, in, uh, from, from your viewpoint. Uh, but what I'm, I've been trying to do, uh, especially over the past uh, few years, is uh, has been to uh, clarify uh, the way. Um, let's say the so-called traditional resources and uh, more specifically uh, references to Chinese canonical texts uh, have been mobilized uh, to, to come to terms with new demands and challenges uh, emanating from the uh, modernizing and now the uh, globalizing process um, in China, in the Chinese context. And I think that um, even if uh, what I'm talking about is very much uh, focused, obviously, on China, uh, I'm just hoping that uh, it might, you know, sort of evoke or, you know, sort of give rise to some echoes or analogy uh, with uh, the um, Indian context, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it, it will. So um, today, um, uh, I'm going to uh, focus on the, let's say, fundamental and traditional uh, tenets of what the Chinese uh, and mainly the um, Confucian tradition uh, meant about uh, when talking about um, um, uh, governance, you know, humane uh, governance, because that was very much, you see, at the center, at the core of, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, Confucian teaching. Um, so just to um, uh, remind you of certain, you know, uh, let's say, basic facts, uh, the word Confucian uh, is a Western uh, neologism, you know, invented by the British, by the way, uh, just uh, at, at, a t at the same time when they were, you know, busy uh, you know, sort of colonizing India, uh, they invented the term Confucian uh, to designate a whole package you know, um, um, uh, that would include very different aspects of uh, Chinese civilization and Chinese culture, but uh, in terms of, let's say, elitist uh, culture, you know, the, 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 let's say the literati culture, and it was coined after the name of Confucius, uh, which itself is a Latinization of um, the uh, Chinese um, uh, name, uh, Kongzi, meaning, you know, Master Kong, uh, who was this character uh, living between the 6th and the 5th uh, centuries BC, okay, before the Common Era, uh, and which would make uh, this character a contemporary, more or less, of the Buddha. You know? So um, uh, you had between, let's say, the 6th and the 5th centuries uh, before the Common Era, uh, this uh, what you know, uh, has been called the Axial Age, uh, because I mean, it, it, you, know, um, you had the uh, Buddha in India, you had Confucius in, in China, you had the uh, pre-Socratic uh, philosophers in Greece, etc. You had the uh, Hebrew civilization, and um, uh, so something, you know, uh, appears to, to have happened in, in this axial age. Anyway, uh, so uh, Confucius was the Latinization of this uh, Chinese term by um, the uh, mission, the Jesuit missionary in the uh, 17th and 18th century. So here you already have. Uh, uh, some common ground between what, what happened uh, in the, Chi the uh, reception of China in Europe and the reception of India in Europe. And it's no surprise that actually for, a, for quite a long time, India and China were sort of uh, packed together in the uh, Europe 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 European representation of the other, you know, the Oriental uh, other. So that that's, um, makes it rather uh, worth uh, observing. So, uh, if we um, approach, I mean, the, the, this um, Chinese um, conception of uh, governance, we might be uh, reminded of um, uh, the um, 
uh, threefold <coughs> classification by Max Weber, you know, this uh, uh, early 20th century uh, German sociologist, uh, I think you all heard of him, you know, uh, more or less. Uh, and uh, Weber would uh, make this distinction between uh, three kinds of domination. You would have uh, the uh, legal domination, uh, which uh, uh, Europe, you know, sort of ended up uh, uh, favoring. You would have the charismatic type of domination, and uh, we still have, you know, in our uh, multiple modernities examples of this, you know, sort of uh, uh, charismatic uh, domination. And the third domination would be the traditionalist uh, type. And uh, if we want to sum up very roughly, you know, the uh, topic of today, uh, we might say that, uh, let's say, uh, classical China has been moving from the charismatic to the uh, traditionalist type of domination. And uh, let's say the legal domination has just uh, come as a very, fairly recent uh, development. So, um, um, I would start with this uh, slide where I try to, um, uh, let's say, put on the same slide, you see, some uh, key words, uh, you, you have the Chinese characters here, uh, that would illustrate what I call um, the cosmological turn, uh, which took place sometime, let's say, between the second and the first millennium uh, before the Common Era in uh, the, uh, uh, you know, within the Chinese civilization. So, uh, to summarize very roughly, because I don't want to spend too much time on this uh, historical aspect, um, Let's say um, China started with, uh, let's say, um, conventionally religious uh, approach to um, the uh, supernatural powers uh, with this uh, cult, for example, um, uh, rendered to um, the uh, supreme ancestor, you know, the, this, uh, let's say, personalized uh, deity. And uh, at the turn of the uh, second to the first millennium, uh, BC, you can note in the, uh, let's say, inscriptions on, on bronze, for example, uh, the uh, turn to uh, this uh, notion of uh, Tian, which means heaven. Okay, and so uh, with uh, this uh, term heaven, you have, um, you, you don't know, you, you don't have to, to know how to read Chinese to notice that uh, this component uh, recurs in the, these uh, three other words, you see. Um, uh, first of all, you know, the uh, decree of heaven, uh, which is uh, supposed to, um, to sanction uh, the, um, let's say, uh, a dynasty that, uh, that is legitimate to rule. So you have very early on this idea that a dynasty has to deserve, you know, to rule. Uh, it's, it's not just, you know, sort of her hereditary process or, you know, just a mechanical succession process. I mean, it has to, uh, uh, theoretically at least, you see, uh, to be able to deserve uh, to, to rule. So you have this notion of the decree of heaven, and of course you have this uh, famous notion of the son of heaven, uh, which would be the... Uh, uh, the sovereign or the emperor, you know, who is um, uh, usually called the son of heaven. And the son of heaven is supposed to reign on uh, whatever is under heaven. Uh, this expression here, tinxia, uh, uh, is very simply a designation for, you know, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, civilizational space, you see. Um, and up to uh, the late 19th century, you know, China, the Chinese Empire, would designate itself as uh, not simply the center of the world. You see, I mean, you, you would know China as the uh, Middle Kingdom or the, uh, you know, the, uh, um, the, uh, the Central Empire, but uh, it would designate itself as very simply and very modestly, you know, uh, the, the world, I mean, you know, uh, all under heaven. All right, so that gives you an idea of the, uh, let's say, this 
imperial, if not imperialistic, you know, uh, self-representation of China. And so uh, the um, uh, Son of Heaven was supposed to um, embody uh, this term here, uh, the, which um, usually is translated into English as uh, virtue, okay? But you shouldn't um, understand uh, virtue uh, as opposed to vice, for example. Um, you should understand it as the uh, virtue or the uh, quality of a, a medicinal plant, for example, you know. Uh, and you should think of uh, the uh, Latin, if not the uh, Sanskrit uh, origin of uh, virtus, virtue, uh, meaning the uh, male quality, you know, the, this, you know, um, potency or the, the power, you know. And so uh, here you have the reference to something that uh, would uh, sound more like a charismatic, you know, charismatic quality, you know. So, uh, that's why I was uh, saying that um, uh, the, uh, let's say, the uh, original concept of uh, power in China would have something to do with what Weber uh, would call the charismatic type of uh, uh, domination. And you um, find the idea that uh, this virtue or charisma of uh, the um, uh, ruler is to, uh, to be visible. Know, and so this virtue is usually um, goes with this idea that it is uh, shining or you know it sort of radiates uh, here you have an interesting uh, character meaning light uh, which is the combination here of the Sun and the moon so the Sun and the moon is uh, is uh, light and the uh, this uh, theme of light or something an aura or uh, something radiating uh, comes together with um, uh, this um, notion of uh, the virtue of the, of the ruler. And the ruler, therefore, is uh, someone who is in a, you know, sort of exalted position, uh, somewhere high up, so that you can see it, you know, from all parts, just as you, everybody, everyone can see, uh, can see the sun or the moon or uh, any star. And um, so you have this idea that uh, the uh, uh, ruler is to embody uh, some kind of exemplarity. Uh, of, of course, I mean, I hasten to, to, uh, uh, to specify that all this is theory, of course. I mean, it's a sort of ideal theory. I mean, it's, it's in the canonical text, you see, and, uh, uh, but from the theory to, you know, you know the uh, historical uh, reality, I mean, there, there's, quite a, there's quite a distance. So uh, this um, uh, uh, ruler, uh, you, you have here the, uh, yeah, the, the, the characters I've uh, uh, shown you before. The, this is uh, heaven, uh, this is the virtue, and this ruler is uh, supposed to uh, embody uh, this character here, uh, which is uh, quite interesting in its um, uh, graphic composition. Um, uh, when we are talking in the, let's say, Indian uh, uh, literati context, there, there is often a reference to, you know, Sanskrit etymology, for example. Uh, and what is standing in Chinese, you see, for etymology would be the composition of the written characters. And so here, uh, you have a character which is composed of this element here, and this, this other one uh, um, uh, beside it. So the element here on the uh, left part is uh, the element um, signifying the human being, okay? Uh, which is uh, um, um, schematized as, um, you know, a sort of uh, two-legged uh, being, you know, so sort of standing, you know, sort of two-legged, you know, uh, a biped in a way. And uh, uh, beside it, you have uh, two strokes, uh, which would mean uh, two, simply, you know. Uh, so in Chinese, it's, it's very simple, you know, one is one stroke, you know, two is two strokes, three is uh, three strokes, and then it becomes more complicated. But, um, but so, I mean, you can, 
<laughs> impress your friends, you see, by counting up to three in Chinese. So, I mean, if you combine uh, these two, you know, you uh, come to this character, uh, which is um, uh, a recurring uh, word, a key word, in uh, uh, the uh, Confucian analects, uh, which are supposed to be a sort of a repository of compendium of uh, what uh, Confucius uh, used to, uh, to teach. Um, and um, uh, so uh, if you take the, um, uh, the combination, that would mean that the, let's say, the uh, uh, human or humane quality um, has to be uh, built in the relationship between, you know, two, uh, two beings or two people. Uh, meaning that uh, you can't really construct, you see, uh, humanity or humaneness, you see, in, um, uh, in isolation, or you can't construct it on a combination of individuals. I mean, it has to be constructed in the relationship itself, all right? And therefore, um, all the, let's say, Confucian cardinal qualities, such as uh, um, uh, filial piety, or loyalty, friendship, trust, etc., you know, uh, are uh, actually, you know, sort of instances of this relational um, uh, dimension of uh, um, this um, uh, humane construction. And um, the this uh, humaneness is supposed to be uh, embodied, as I said, in the ruler, uh, uh, which uh, corresponds to this character here. This character means the prince, all right, and. Uh, what is interesting in the uh, Confucian teaching is that um, uh, the prince, which is, uh, of course, a, a sort of eminently uh, social um, uh, uh, designation, sorry, uh, has become in the Confucian teaching uh, a moral uh, value. Uh, since here you have this expression which means the son of a prince, you know, uh, um, that is, you know, a member of the aristocracy. But in the Confucian teaching, it becomes uh, a man of moral quality. So you have the direct translation of, uh, let's say, um, uh, um, a social notion of a, a prince becoming, you know, a, a moral notion of uh, someone who is. Uh, let's say, a, a nobleman in uh, moral character. So uh, what I'm trying to drive at, you see, uh, you, you might already be, can be completely lost in all these Chinese characters, is this uh, continuity you know, between, uh, let's say, this notion of domination of power, which translates directly or continuously into uh, something uh, of a moral uh, nature. Um, and it, I think it's uh, quite interesting to note that um, in the modern uh, parlance, I mean in modern Chinese, um, the way to uh, talk about the state would be um, a, a combined word uh, which would mean the country and the family. Okay? So if you want to designate the state, you would say guojia, meaning, you know, uh, the country and the family, meaning that these two uh, dimensions are, you know, um, exactly um, in um, uh, in a sort of superposition. You know, uh, the family develops directly into the country. All right, so you have this uh, very organic um, uh, notion of uh, what we would call in a Western context, you see, uh, sort of, uh, let's say. Uh, political dimension. So um, the best illustration of this continuity between, let's say, the uh, political and the moral would be uh, this word here that, uh, that is also central in the uh, Confucian teaching. And you can see that uh, 
here on the left, uh, you have a component that is usually you know, written like this, um, which means uh, upright. And so uh, Confucius would say that uh, uh, governing, because here you have the, uh, the word that uh, would mean you know, uh, governing or governance, uh, governing is uh, a matter of being upright. All right? So you find again this idea that you know, um, uh, governing or ruling is, uh, in a, let's say, primordial way, um, a matter of, uh, for, for the ruler uh, uh, to be, you know, sort of upright uh, in himself. Um, so um, the ruler should, um, let's say, uh, embody this uh, central uh, exemplarity, uh, which works from uh, person to person. Um, as I said, you see, in a highly uh, let's say, uh, relational uh, dimension. And you have this idea that the ruler stands at the center of, uh, let's say, the, uh, uh, so, so, let's say, the uh, uh, so, socio-political body. Um, and um, his influence or his aura would move out in ever wider uh, concentric circles. And uh, you have in the canonical uh, sources this idea that everything starts from the self, you know, uh, and I, I believe that uh, there is something similar, you know, in the uh, uh, Indian tradition, you know, that uh, uh, you have this, um, uh, let's say, this training in self-cultivation, mm -hmm. uh, and then it sort of enlarges to the, to the family circle, and then from the family, it, it enlarges to, uh, let's say, the, the uh, wider community, and from the wider community to the country, and from the country to the whole world. So you have this uh, very, you know, powerfully uh, centered, you see, uh, vision of things, and uh, um, this idea that uh, if the ruler is capable of, you know, sort of uh, um, training himself, you see, in this... Uh, 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 moral sense, you know, it will, uh, in a way, contaminate um, the uh, surrounding uh, social body, you know, in a, in a sort of um, continuous, uh, continuous way. And um, this leads, and uh, I, I'll be uh, finished very, very soon, so this leads uh, to the idea uh, that, that um, goes back to uh, High antiquity, you know, uh, to the idea uh, that uh, society, the, the uh, social body, uh, shouldn't be ruled uh, only uh, through, let's say, uh, laws, you know, objective laws, but through um, a ritualistic uh, culture. And there again, I think, you know, uh, there would be some. Uh, interesting, you know, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, analogies to, to be made with, with India, of course, you see, because as soon as you are talking about rites and rituals, um, uh, of course you would think of, um, you know, what, what, uh, what has been uh, happening in, in India. And uh, in, in China, uh, there is this Confucian idea that uh, the uh, body politic, you see, uh, is to be, you know, ruled through a sort of principle of self-regulation um, that uh, functions, you see, through a ritual attitude uh, towards others and also a sort of a ritualistic way of the, of the ruler I mean, to um, um, uh, influence, you see, the, um, uh, his uh, subjects, you see, through this ever-widening influence and not through, you know, uh, let's say, um, legal uh, coercion. And there has been this um, very ancient uh, debate see, between the Confucians and what, what have been called the legalists, you see, and the legalists thinking that uh, only objective laws, you see, could, could uh, uh, exercise um, uh, an efficient, you see, uh, coercion on the, the body politic. And, um, and Confucius would uh, reply that uh, 
if you only you know, impose law by force, uh, people, of course, will submit to it, but not you know, have any feeling of uh, shame. And so we'll try to you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, avoid, you see, a bit being submitted to the law, whereas you know, the sense of shame would be there, you know, always present and be more effective, you see, in the, in the, in the long run. So, um, to uh, conclude, I mean, this, um, let's say, this uh, Chinese lesson number one, you see, um, I would, um, you know, end up on this uh, interesting character here, uh, which means uh, the king, you know, um, and um, uh, which has been uh, interpreted, of course, I mean, this uh, interpretation is quite... Uh, um, uh, arbitrary, but, uh, but, but it's interesting in itself. Um, uh, in very, it has been interpreted in cosmological terms. Uh, you have here, you know, a very simple character, uh, which, by the way, is pronounced, you know, and uh, this is my um, uh, spouse name. You see, I was married to a, a Chinese gentleman called Wang. You know. Uh, he uh, died of cancer in, uh, nearly two years ago now. Uh, but um, Wang is, uh, uh, if you know uh, any Chinese, you see, uh, um, you, you might notice that it's one of the most uh, common, you know, chi Chinese surnames, family names. Uh, and it means king. And this interpretation um, is, is interesting. Uh, you have uh, three... Um, um, horizontal strokes uh, linked together by a vertical stroke here. And the interpretation would, would run like this. I mean, the um, upper uh, horizontal stroke would be heaven. Uh, the lower one would be earth, okay? And the middle one would be man, you know? So man, you know, between heaven and earth, and uh, the king, you know, the ruler, being the uh, axis mundi, or, you know, the link between these three, you know, uh, cosmological tiers, or three cosmological layers, you see. And so that tells you uh, something about um, this uh, Chinese traditional con conception of power, uh, which, um, of course, again, is a very ideal, uh, idealized one, but has been, you know, uh, let's say, um, in the imperial ideology, uh, down to um, the uh, late 19th century, you know, uh, I would remind you here that uh, the Chinese uh, imperial system only collapsed in the early 20th century, you know, in 1911. So that, that was just one century ago. So in a way, uh, when you're talking about modernity in China, you know, you're talking about something um, uh, very, very recent, all right? So, uh, this uh, cosmological and, let's say, moral uh, vision of power uh, has been uh, superimposed, you know, as a sort of imperial ideology uh, over uh, a bureaucratic structure, you know. I mean, the uh, Chinese empire has devised a very sophisticated, you know, sort of uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, mode of management, you see. Um, uh, and uh, which um, has been, in a way, uh, quite uh, efficient. And in, in a way, uh, and we we're going to talk about it uh, tomorrow morning, in a way uh, has been, um, let's say, continued in the um, present structures of uh, communist China, you know, because the uh, party, uh, the uh, single communist party structure in China, um, has been sort of uh, using the capillarity of the imperial, you know, bureaucracy. Um, and so you have this superimposition of, you know, this bureaucratic uh, management, and on top of it you see this, you know, imperial uh, uh, self-representation of uh, the king as being this link, you know, this cosmological link between uh, heaven and earth, you see. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, through this uh, character, uh, something that is very, you know, sort of uh, very symmetrical, very uh, powerfully centered, um, and um, I think which uh, 
would uh, uh, make the, something like um, the um, Chinese, um, let's say, specific way of um, uh, developing. And uh, of course, I mean, that um, creates an interesting uh, contrast with, with uh, India, which has uh, followed, a, 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 let's say, a different, uh, well, uh, historical mode and uh, 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 historical destiny. But um, um, uh, what uh, I would, you know, sort of conclude on would be that this, um, let's say, the um, uh, this um, not only this very centralized and centered um, uh, conception. Uh, in space, but also uh, this, um, uh, let's say, this continuity between, let's say, the uh, um, individual moral dimension of self-cultivation and sort of radiating onto, uh, let's say, the uh, society at large. And uh, the whole question that we're going to tackle tomorrow morning is that, uh, is this continuum, you know, sort of, um, uh, uh, let's say, um, d does it favor um, a, a political uh, conception of uh, society? I mean, that, that's the, the whole uh, problem. So, well, thank you for, for your attention. And I, I've been trying to be very brief so, so as uh, to, you know, uh, elicit some, uh, some questions from, uh, from the floor. Thank you. Thanks.